Today we're going to begin our unit on looking at gas laws. So we've spent the last chapter talking about properties of what does it mean to be a solid, liquid, and gas. Um, again, gas we talked about in terms of energy. They have the most amount of kinetic energy and those tend to exist at higher temperatures because they have higher kinetic energy. Think about your heating curves that as you make your way up the heating curve, gases are found at the highest temperature range because you need a lot of energy to break up those particles that make up that matter to then again give them a must, a, enough energy to then make them have a higher temperature. So there's four variables that we use to describe gases. So again, like I said, this unit, we're looking specifically at gases and how they behave under different conditions. So the first variable that describes a gas is the temperature. And I kind of just mentioned this already. So when we measure temperature of something, we are measuring the kinetic energy at which it moves. So the higher the temperature, that means those particles are moving faster, so they have more kinetic energy. We have our um, temperature scale. Typically, when we describe gases, we talk about them in Celsius or Kelvin. We use this equation last unit um, that to make something in Kelvin, you just take your degree Celsius and add 273 to it. The reason why we have to use the Kelvin scale is because, again, the lowest possible temperature on the scale is zero, working its way up. And so it's important to factor out when we have like a negative temperature in Celsius, we won't see that in Kelvin. And that makes our equations work out easier and better, um, not having that negative sign in there. And so you can see the picture at the bottom um, that a higher temperature, they're going to be moving faster. We see those with the longer um, vector arrows as where the lower temperature on the right, those have um, lower amount of energy. And so again, showing it as vector arrows that are shorter in length. The next variable that we can use to describe a gas is its volume. So we talked about volume at the beginning of the year with density. Again, volume is the amount of space an object occupies. And gases, because they have a lot of energy and they're moving very fast, they're mostly empty space. And so volume is a very interesting variable to look at with gases because we can manipulate it a lot more than we see in solids because, again, a gas is mostly empty space. And so volume, if you think about it from a geometry aspect, if you're looking at something that's rectangular, you can take its length, width, and height and determine its volume. We will um, see this unit a lot throughout um, each of our equations that we work with to describe how gases will behave. So we can describe volume as in liters or milliliters, like what we measure with a graduated cylinder. Depending on what it's contained in, you can also describe it as cubic centimeters or cubic meters. So again, if you take length times width times height, that will give you, if you're measuring in centimeters, centimeters cubed or if you're measuring in meters, meters cubed. The next variable is pressure. And so pressure is something we're gonna talk a lot more about in this chapter. We saw pressure in our vapor pressure curves in which, in which something will boil, so a liquid changing to a gas, and we looked at it through the phase diagrams where we look at how pressure and temperature can impact what state of matter it is. So um, when we measure pressure, we're measuring a force. And that force is caused by gas particles exerting it over an area. And so there's an equation. We don't really calculate it here in chemistry, but if you go on to take physics, you'll definitely probably talk about pressure then. So you look at how much force is being created over an area at which um, a material is being contained within. So essentially when you measure pressure, like if you go to use a um, tire gauge and measure the pressure of your tires on your vehicle, you're essentially measuring with how much speed those gas particles are colliding with the walls of the container. So your pressure in your tires are caused by those collisions of the gases colliding with the walls of the tire. And so the more pressure you have, they're colliding with more energy at a faster rate. Uh, if you have less pressure, that means that they are colliding with less energy um, at a slower rate. 
we are going to see pressure again we talked about standard pressure and so we have those four units that we work with we have the one atm or one atmosphere of pressure um, we have 760 millimeters of mercury or mmhg which is equivalent or the same as tor again we're just um, two different units essentially measuring the same thing just to give honor to that scientist so 760 tor and then we have 101.3 kilopascals or kpa the next thing that will decide the behavior of a gas is the particles so a gas with equal volumes under the same conditions of pressure and temperature will have equal number of particles and so we get avogadro's law from there and so we're going to see the mole show back up to quantify the amount of gas that you have um, again, this unit, we've our conversion factor, I should say, more than unit, we have seen before, and that is um, that the volume of a gas at STP, again, STP means standard temperature and pressure, so standard temperature is zero um, Kelvin, um, and our zero degrees Celsius, 273 Kelvin, pressure would be like one ATM, 760 millimeters of mercury, and that's one mole is um, 22.4 liters. So from that, um, again, standard temperature and pressure, we um, need to have comparison. And so STP gives us something to compare to when we look at manipulating these variables of a gas. And so again, STP, the T for temperature, um, can be 273 Kelvin or the zero degrees Celsius. And pressure can be any of those given pressures. So 760 Tor, 101.3 kPa, 760 millimeters of mercury, or one atmosphere of pressure. So gas laws, there's different um, equations that we can look at that will describe the behavior of a gas under different conditions. Um, different equations work with different variables, but we typically see temperature, volume, pressure, and moles. We use an uppercase T for temperature, an uppercase V for volume, uppercase P for pressure, and we use lowercase n for moles. We can't use M. Um, lowercase m stands for molality, uppercase m stands for molarity. So those had already been used, so we use N as basically number of moles. And so we're going to again see these four different variables throughout our different equations. So today we're going to work on two laws that work mainly with pressure, volume, and temperature. We'll see moles later on when we get to what's called the ideal gas law. So the first equation we're going to work with is Boyle's law. And the first thing we assume under Boyle's law is if we maintain a gas at constant temperature, we can look at um, pressure and volume. And so we say that these are inversely proportional. So the word inversely means that if one goes up, the other goes down. So if you think about it, if you increase the pressure on a system, that means the volume has to get smaller. So to have more pressure, that means your volume needs to get smaller, so you have a smaller space. Those gas particles will then collide with more um, energy and increase the pressure. If your pressure goes down, that means your volume needs to get larger. So to have a decrease in pressure, you give those gas particles more space to move. When they have more space to move, there's going to be fewer collisions, and fewer collisions results in a decrease in pressure. So if you take a look at your equation sheet, you have this equation P1V1 is equal to P2V2. P standing for pressure, V standing for volume. So the thing we see new this particular chapter is the subscript. So we have this P1V1, so I'm going to erase that because it's kind of in the way. But that one part just means the initial condition. So when the system started before any changes were made, we describe that as one. The two is after the change. So after you've manipulated one of these variables, what's the new resulting pressure and new resulting volume? So those are kind of like initial versus final. So we use P1V1 is equal to P2V2. So here, this kind of shows a better diagram on explaining Boyle's law. So we can see in the cylinder or piston all the way to the left, they have the most amount of volume. And so we can take a look our pressure is measured at one ATM. We can see that here. Um, oh, let's see here, let me backtrack. Right here on our graph. The middle column shows that the volume is decreased. That piston moves, those gas particles have less space to move. 
So you're gonna have more collisions in that um, particular piston with the walls and we see volume went down and the pressure went up. We shrink the piston um, amount of volume even more and we see another decrease in um, volume leads to an increase in pressure. So these are what we call inversely proportionate to each other. Notice that in each condition, the temperature is held constant. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples that work with Boyle's law. So we start out with the sample of oxygen gas occupies a volume of 250 milliliters at 240 torr pressure. What volume will it occupy at 800 torr pressure? So we have initial conditions, and that's going to be what it started out with. That's going to be this 250 milliliters and the 740 torr. I look at milliliters. What does milliliters measure? Well, that's a volume. So I'm going to set up my problems like this. So I'm going to say my V1 is 250 milliliters. I can see that at that volume, it was held at 740 torr. Torr is a pressure measurement, so that's P1. What volume will it occupy at 800 torr pressure? So we are changing the pressure of the system. So the new pressure, the final pressure, I will identify as P2, and that's 800 torr. So that leaves me with what volume will it occupy, so we're looking at how much space will it have. I can already kind of make a prediction. I can see that my pressure is going to increase. So for pressure to increase, because this is an inversely proportionate set of variables, that means my volume has to get smaller. So when I solve this, I can predict that my V2 should be something smaller than 250. So I know my equation with these two variables will be the V1, P1, is equal to V2P2. I can go ahead and start substituting in. So I have my 250 milliliters times 740 torr is equal to my V2. I can either leave it as V2 or X. I'm just going to substitute in X. And my P2 is 800 torr. So this is just a matter of can you solve for an X? So I can see I'm doing multiplication. What do I need to do to get x by itself? Well, I need to divide. So I'm going to divide by 800 torr. So in my calculator, you're going to take the 250 times 740. Hit Enter. Then you want to do your division step and divide it out. Two decimal places will be good. So I get an answer of somewhere around 231. 0.25. Let's talk units. I can see I have tor up top and tor below. What am I left with? Milliliters. If I look back, the equation asked me to sign, find volume, which milliliters is a volume measurement. And just like I predicted, my volume went down relative to my V1. So because the pressure went up, the volume had to get smaller, which my number shows that. Let's take a look at another example. So a sample of carbon dioxide occupies a volume of 3.5 liters at 125 kPa pressure. What pressure would the gas exert if the volume was decreased to 2 liters? So I can see here that um, I'm measuring my volume in liters. So I have a V1 of, oops, I went to the wrong side. Let me backtrack. There we go. So my V1 is 3.5 liters, and my V2 is 2 liters. I know the initial pressure conditions is 125 kPa. So that means I am solving for P2. And it asks what pressure would the gas exert. The one thing you do want to look for is making sure units agree. So I can see that both volumes are in liters, so that problem is ready to solve. My pressure will be in the unit of kPa. So I'm using V1, P1, V2, P2. Substitute in 3.5 liters times 125 kPa equals 2 liters times an x. Just like in the previous problem, to get x by itself, we want to divide by 2 liters. So what you need to do is take 3.5 times 125. Hit enter in your calculator, divide it out, 
And so then you get um, divide by the two and you get approximately 218.75. Looking at units, liters eliminate, and we should have it as KPA. The last example um, is something that you just got to kind of start looking out for is unit agreement. So chlorine, it tells us it occupies a volume of 1.2 liters and 720 torr of pressure. What volume will it occupy at one atmosphere? So my initial conditions tells me that my volume was 1.2 liters and my pressure is at 720 torr. It asks what volume, so I'm solving for V2. So that means I have a second pressure, which I do, and that's one ATM. If I take a look, my units do not agree right now. You need to have units agreeing in the same pressure unit um, in order for units to eliminate right to get your new volume conditions correct. So here you need to do a conversion. It doesn't matter which one you convert, they just have to agree. So you could change TOR to ATM, or you could change ATM to TOR. I'm just going to change ATM to TOR. So if I look at my conversion factors, again, those are those standard pressures. If you look at the front side of the note page, those are given to you. I can find that one ATM is equal to 760 TOR. So the math is pretty easy here. It's equal to 760 TOR. So that's what I'm going to use for my P2. Now it's just solving like what we've done in the past. So I have 1.2 liters times 720 torr equal to x times 760 torr. Divide it out. And that gives us that x is equal to 1.14 liters. Okay, so again, the only thing different about this particular problem was you had to do a conversion to get your units in agreement. The same thing can happen with volume. Um, so we're gonna see situations where you need to convert volume. You may have one given in liters and the other in milliliters. You just need to get them to a unit that agrees. So I'm gonna skip example four and move on to the other law. We're gonna look at Charles law today, which looks at volume and temperature. So this, Law looks at, if you think about it, if temperature decreases, volume is going to decrease. And so temperature is directly proportional to kinetic energy. So that means these gas particles are moving slower. So as they start to move slower, that space in between them starts to get reduced. And if you reduce it enough, you're going to go through a phase change and change it over to a liquid. And if you think about it, liquid has less space between them than a gas. We're not cooling them to the point that they're changing over to a liquid, but we're looking at just changing the temperature of the gas while it's still in the gaseous state. So if you increase the temperature, the amount of volume it's going to see go up. This happens to your tires. In the winter time, the pressure on your tires tends to go down, so you tend to have to add air to your tires in the winter time, and that's because the temperature drop, and so you get a less pressure because it's taking up less space. Um, and vice versa, in the summertime, you usually have to let a little air out of your tires because as the temperature warms up, um, they tend to take up more space, and so you have to let some pressure out. And so um, we're keeping pressure constant. We're just looking at how does temperature impact volume. And so again, we have a graph that shows that. Um, and so from here, it shows it in two graphs, Celsius um, versus um, Kelvin in the two graphs. And so we can see a direct proportion. So when you look at a graph and you have a nice linear slope, either positive or negative, that means if one goes up, the other goes up. So again, if we take a look, here we have a temperature rise. As the temperature rises, the volume increases. And that's because, again, if you take a look here, particles are starting to move faster, and that allows for the piston to expand. So his law, and I didn't put this into the note page, but it is on your formula sheet, um, looks like this. So it's V1. over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. Again, we see that one and two, initial and final. So we can see that it's occupying a volume of 2.5 liters to start, so that's my V1. And its initial temperature is 300 Kelvin. 
what temperature will the balloon expand to? 7.5 liters. So my new volume um, is 7.5 liters. I can see that the liter units are in agreement, so I don't need to do a conversion here. My temperature too is a question mark. Notice that temperature is in Kelvin. Temperature must always be in Kelvin. So if you come across a problem that it gives you in Celsius, you need to convert it. So I know I'm using this formula, so I'm gonna substitute in. I have 2.5 liters over 300 Kelvin is equal to 7.5 liters over my X. I'm solving for my new temperature. So because this is fraction form, hopefully you can recognize this, we need to cross multiply to solve. So I'm gonna cross multiply my numerator with my denominator on the bottom um, of the other side. So I'm gonna take 2.5 liters times X. To get my other side, I'm gonna multiply my other two variables. So my 300 Kelvin times 7.5 liters. Now this looks just kind of like what we left off with. Now to get X by itself, 2.5 liters. So again, we needed to get that out of fraction form. So now you just need to multiply and do one division step. When you do that, you get approximately 900 Kelvin. It doesn't specify what temperature unit it wants, so you can leave it as Kelvin, but sometimes you need to be on the lookout if it asks for Celsius, okay? Let's look at another example. We have hydrogen gas was cooled from 150 to 50 degrees Celsius. Its new volume is 75 milliliters. What is the original volume? So it's asking for something very specific. So because it's asking for original volume, that means we're looking for the initial volume condition. So we do not know that. It tells us it went from 150 to 50. So it started out at 150 degrees Celsius. I can see right away it's in Celsius. We need to get rid of that. So to convert to Kelvin, we just got to add 273. So I'm going to take care of those steps now before I even put it into the equation. When I do the addition, that gives me 423 Kelvin. To move on, my volume, so it says it's new volume, so that's after the change, so that's 75 milliliters. And then it says um, that it, it ended at a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. So just like the 150, we got to swap it by adding 273. Once I do that addition step, I get an answer of 323 Kelvin. I know that I'm using V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. So to start substituting in, V1 is my X. I'm going to use my 423 Kelvin. My V2, 75 milliliters. T2 is 323. So again, we want to cross multiply here, so we get 323 Kelvin times X is equal to 423 times 75. And I forgot my unit there. Solve for X by doing my division. I can see Kelvin eliminates, so I just need to multiply and divide it out. I'm going to get an answer in milliliters. So my new volume is 98.22 milliliters. It didn't ask for a specific unit for volume, so we can just leave it in the ML unit. So here's um, the basic rundown on how to use Boyle and Charles Law. When you look at your homework, if you do this step here, that will decide what unit or which equation to use. So if you're using volume and temperature, you're gonna use Charles Law. If the problem mentions volume and pressure, you're gonna use boils, which is the V1, P1 equals V2, P2. So again, just be careful at looking at the homework, which variables you're given, because that will decide which of these two equations you're gonna need. The other thing to look out for is just make sure your units are in agreement, do a conversion if necessary, temperature must be in Kelvin. So you have to swap it over. If it then asks for temperature in Celsius, you'll have one final step to change it back to Celsius. So this is a quick run through on Boyle's and Charles Law.